Grow, Sell, and Retire is the podcast for the lazy overachiever. B.D. Dalton, author of True Gravity and Grow, Sell, and Retire, is here to give you his 25 years of secrets, tips, and systems to take your business to the next level. This is your chance to find out what is working in sales, marketing, and running your business. If you stop learning, you stop burning. Now, here's your host, BD, with today's GSR Podcast. Hey, everybody. BD Dalton here, Grow, Sell, and Retire Podcast. This is the 100th episode. This is Grow of Grow, Sell, and Retire with John Mullins, author of Customer Funded Business. Sit back, relax, and enjoy. Hey, everybody. B.D. Dalton here for the Grow, Sell, and Retire podcast. I'm working on the 100th episode of Grow, Sell, and Retire, and I'm here with John Mullins. And you've written three books, a lot, a lot of other papers, things like that. I'm going to kind of list them out, John, and could you run us through kind of a, a synopsis, a, just a general synopsis of, of what each of the little books entail. They're not little books, but focuses. So Happy customer, to do that, BD. Customer-funded business. Walk us through that. So the, the core idea there, it's my newest book, uh, and the core idea is that everybody's kind of drunk the venture capital Kool-Aid over the last couple of generations, that the, that the first port of call for an entrepreneur when he, he or she starts a new business is to figure out Who's going to give me the money to start it, whether that's an angel or a venture capital investor or whatever? And uh, I take issue with that assumption. And the book takes issue with that assumption and says, uh, gee, really, your first part of call should be your customers. And there are five models through which you can get a customer to fund your business. And the book lays them out and tells stories of fantastic companies like Michael Dell's that have done it that way. Um, and argues that we need to rethink all this stuff we've been talking about for decades. Because, I mean, Dragon's Den and things like that, and we run something up here called the Bull Ring. It's, it's made it sexy to take money on and not without almost like with reckless abandon that they don't understand what it, what it takes or what yeah, it takes exactly. away. Yeah. And, and you know, when, once, you, once you raise money from, uh, you know, from an outside investor, you, you raise that money by telling them what you're going to do with it. But of, of course, we, we know that for most entrepreneurs, what actually works is not plan A, which gets to my second book that you're going to talk about in a minute, but, but plan B. But if you've, t- if you've taken money from an investor, what that investor wants you to do is flawlessly execute plan A. But if, if you figure out that plan A isn't actually the right plan, well, then you've created the problem for yourself. So it's, it's much better to get to a, to a place where your business can demonstrably work, where you've got customer traction, you've got a business model that's working. That's when, when you raise money if you need to, or, or maybe you figure out a way you don't need to. Awesome. So let's get straight into that. So you wrote it with Randy Commissar. So you've, you've got getting to plan B. So what, what was that about? So you kind of alluded to it a little bit, but not not went in depth. Yeah. So, so the basic idea is that when we, when Randy and I wrote that book, the the phrase business model was on the tip of everybody's tongue. Uh, but we didn't think people really knew what they were talking about when they used those words. It was just kind of cool. So we sort of dug into it and we said, well, wait a second, given this phenomenon that I just described, that plan A most typically does work, uh, if it's plan E, if, if it's plan B, or in the case of PayPal, it was plan G, the seventh plan for Max Levkin's <laughs> technology at work. If that if that's the real world, then why the hell are we investing all this time and energy in writing business plans for plan A? And couldn't we figure out a process, a, a disciplined process, by which we could get from the place we start, let's call that plan A, to a place that's really going to going to work, whether that's plan, you know, B or G or Z. So, so the book articulates a process by which you get there. It's the way, the way Steve Jobs moved Apple from a, you know, a failing uh, single digit player in the PC industry to, to, uh, you know, reinventing the music industry. So we talk about a process in the book. And then we break down this, this notion of a business model into its five elements, the revenue model, the gross margin model, the operating model, the working capital model, and the investment model. 
and and we provide some tools by which a, an entrepreneur can think about the business model uh, in, in a more constructive and cash focused way, and, and get a better idea whether whether Plan A even has a chance. That's awesome. Okay, and then you got on to the new business road test. So where where did that go? Well, that that was that was my first book and remains my best selling book. It's it's now the I think it's fair to say it's the standard way that entrepreneurs and investors think about new venture opportunities and asking themselves the fundamental question, you know, is this idea actually any good? Uh, and entrepreneurs, you know, I've been one and you've been one. And, you know, we all have ideas a dime a dozen, but, but we can't pursue them all. And I think it's really important these days that we that we channel the the entrepreneurial talent around the world into the pursuit of of opportunities that have a fighting chance to succeed. It's a terribly difficult road. We know what the prior odds are. They're very difficult. And so let's get people working on, you know, good opportunities rather than ideas of the moment. And so the book laid out back in 2003 when the first edition came out, a framework that I call the seven, seven domains for asking fundamental evidence-based questions about the market. How attractive is this market you're proposing to serve? Questions about the industry. Is this really an industry in which you want to compete? And about the team. Is this the right team to pursue this particular opportunity? If not, what are the gaps and you know how do, how do you fill them? So the book, uh, I think, really struck a chord because there was nothing in the in the literature that did that in 2003, and frankly, there still isn't today. So it's, the book's now in its fifth edition. It's used in universities and college courses in entrepreneurship all over the world, and and uh, you know, VCs have it on their bookshelf. Angel investors have it by their side. It's a nice way to to think about to, to make sure you think about the critical issues before you either start, you know, maybe a lean startup today or before you uh, make an early stage angel, angel investment. That's awesome. So if we look through, you, you've got all those different, those platforms and different ways that people can look at it. So if, if my first question is, is why do so many companies struggle to get traction? So you've talked about all these different ways that people should, should look at their business. Why you've come up with this great idea in your basement or you're breaking away from your KPMG employer or whoever else it is, and you're going to go out and set up on your own. Why do so many people or entrepreneurs or teams struggle to get traction in their business? Well, there, there are lots of reasons, of course. Um, I, I suppose the biggest reason is that the entrepreneur is trying to sell something that the customer has no need for. And, and what really good entrepreneurs do is they solve problems uh, that some customer has in a better way than those problems have been solved before. Or alternatively, you know, they, call, they, they do what I call customer delight. You know, Starbucks, when it started, didn't really solve a problem. We could find a cup of coffee somewhere. It just wasn't a very good coffee cup of coffee and it wasn't a very good experience so so starbucks revolutionized that and and made it delightful well those are i think the two ways that that you begin to get traction in a business and so if you're not offering one or the other of those then why is the customer going to buy from you they're, they're probably not but that's and, and maybe that's the biggest reason why why things don't get traction and why Max Levkin's encryption technology back with plan A didn't get any traction because connecting handheld with wired devices in an encrypted way was not something that it turned out he could sell. People didn't think that was a big problem. Um, it wasn't until he got to plan G where, where that, that uh, really secure encryption paid off as people began to use his technology to make eBay, eBay transactions online. So, you know, some t sometimes it's you're trying to solve a problem that the customer says, actually, you know, I don't have a problem with that. Sometimes it's you're trying to do something that you think is better, but the customer doesn't think it's better. Sometimes you're targeting the wrong customer. Sometimes you're not the right team to pursue it. So, you know, you think you have the pieces in place team-wise, but 
perhaps the team doesn't understand how the distribution channel works or the team doesn't really understand the customer setting or whatever. So, you know, there, there, there's no shortage of reasons why traction is not obtained in the early days in a new venture. But, but that is the fundamental problem, and it's a problem that, that the seven domains, the framework and the new business road test, helps shed light on so you can get a better understanding of, you know, what it's going to take uh, to make a particular idea work. So going into, you're growing your business, what, when it comes to sales, what should people line up as a priority? So if we talked about going back to it taking to plan G for, for PayPal to come up, when, when somebody's setting up and moving their business forward past the startup phase, but they've already got some traction, um, what should they focus on as their priorities when it comes to sales besides more sales? Well, you know, th- th- there is essentially um, two, th- th- there are only four ways to grow a business if you want to think about it. There's a guy named Igor Ansoff who was at Harvard many years ago, and he, he said, look, there are new markets and there are existing markets, and there are new products and there are existing products, and you can make yourself a little a little two-by-two two grid and those are the, the four ways you can grow. You know, you can, you can keep trying harder in your existing product and with, your, with your existing product and your existing set of customers and, and keep trying to sell that more. Or you can say, well, maybe I, maybe I need to serve a different target market. Well, that's one way to grow. That's a market development strategy, Ansoff called it. Another way to grow is to say, well, let's, let's take this this existing set of customers, but let's give them something more. We can solve other needs that they also have. That's a product development strategy. You take new products to those existing set of customers you're already serving. Or uh, riskier, perhaps, you, yes. you can do something that's new, new. You know, you can, you can say, well, I'm going to enter this new market and it's going to be with a new set of products as well. Now, that's likely to be more difficult because you may not understand the customer needs in that new market, and you may not uh, have what it takes to build the right product to serve whatever those needs are. So Ansoff would say that's the riskiest way to grow. But fundamentally, those are the four ways to grow. Mm-hmm. And um, it's, it's typically not very clear which of those is the right way to grow in a particular setting, right? So what you have to do is, you know, experiment to test hypotheses. That's that's what entrepreneurship's about. And, you, and, you and so know. when you're testing those, so that kind of leads into my next one. So if you're it, with with just with one of those measures, uh, in in this world of sometimes not having to have profits or things like that, what are some measurements that people should use when they're either setting out in a new new market or a new existing or you know, kind of that? What are, what are some of your favorites besides cash in the bank? Um, what what they should they be measuring? Well, ultimately, you've got to measure whether the customer is buying your stuff. But 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 um, depending on the way you're reaching out to your customer, there there are interim measures that help you. So if you're selling online, the beauty of doing so is everything's measurable. So you can you can measure what it's costing you to bring somebody into your sales funnel. Then you can measure whether they go from your landing page down to the next page, and then whether they go from there to buy and so on. All, all those steps in getting a customer from being aware of this new thing that you've got to actually putting their money down with a credit card or writing a check or, or signing a purchase contract, those are all measurable steps. And, uh, you know, we can get data about those things. So that, that's what you've got to do. And you've got to compare that data to benchmarks and, and to what you're able to do with your other products and, and, you know, figure out if it's worth it. I'm spending this much to get a customer. How much is that customer worth? And, you know, am I getting where I, where I want to go? And do you think in kind of what, what you've seen and what people report about, are people more excited in the press, not, not in like accounting circles or VC? Are they more excited about turnover or are they more excited about profits in today's press driven and an internet driven excitement on business topics well i i i, I think uh, we're beginning to 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 see uh, the signs of a resetting of those expectations 
you know, for the last, uh, what, decade or so, there's been a lot of talk about unicorns and these private companies with these astonishing valuations that private investors have given them. But, but uh, as we've seen with Lyft and Uber and, and more dramatically with WeWork, some of those uh, valuations really don't stand the test of scrutiny when it comes to the public markets. So um, I, 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 think, I, I think we're going to see a resetting, and I think there's going to be an increased concern with profit and, more pertinently, cash flow, and uh, not so much focus on the revenue hype that we've seen uh, in recent years, it's all been fueled by cheap VC, cheap VC money in abundance uh, that's pursuing growth at all costs without much regard to uh, whether there's a real business model. And, you know, it's not clear whether Uber is ever going to make money or lift. It's pretty clear that WeWork is highly vulnerable uh, and, and the stock markets have... Uh, has spoken their piece, right? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. And everybody on the bank and everybody else. So it was quite a, but, and, and we talked about it very, at the very beginning is the venture capital is kind of sexy and, and people are, are into it. So what are the perils of taking on an investor or taking on venture capital? Um, and are there some stories that you can think of that somebody should, should listen to when it comes to, Hey, I'm seeking investment. Well, I, I, th- I think there are a lot of drawbacks to doing that. Uh, one of them is that raising capital all by itself is a full-time job, and any entrepreneur who's raised ex- external money will tell you that. So if you're spending all your time raising capital, it's pretty clear what you're not spending your time on. You're not spending your time figuring out how to better satisfy your customers' needs. So you take your eye off the operating ball, um, and, and, and you're going to pay a price. It's going to slow you down. It's kind of counterintuitive. The more time you spend trying to raise money, the less time you make spent really making progress in the business. So that's a big drawback. There's a big drawback in terms of the, the terms you get when you get early money, and, and there's good reason for that, because if, if you raise money early on before you've really proven much, it, it's all a guess. You know, Nobody knows really whether it's going to work and whether plan A is going to work or plan E is going to work or whatever it is. And, and so to compensate for that risk, the venture capitalist or the angel investor needs, um, needs a bunch of downside protection, and, and that's detailed in the term sheet and ultimately in a shareholder's agreement. And I can guarantee every entrepreneur that the one thing they won't like is the shareholder's agreement. It's onerous. It's designed to protect the investor when things don't go as well as hoped. And what we know about the prior odds means that most of the time they don't go as hoped. So there's a lot of baggage that comes along with it, and that's going to inevitably lead to, to misaligned objectives. And there's a, there's a really interesting exit that happened in 2018. Uh, there's a, a company, Irish, is it Irish or Scottish? Maybe it's a Sky, Scottish company called uh, FanDuel. Yep. And they were, they were an online uh, betting. They were doing fantasy football and, and other online betting kinds of things and growing very, very fast thanks to round after round after round of, of venture capital. And uh, they exited in 2018 for a figure north of $400 million U.S. million. So one would think that's a fantastic exit, right? These guys went in fewer than 10 years from standing start to, to that kind of valuation. But, but what hadn't been realized is that each time they raised another round, that round comes with something called a liquidation preference, which basically says we, the shareholders in this round, get our money back first before the ordinary shareholders get anything. Yes. Well, when you stack up all of those liquidation preferences, round after round after round, the sum total of those was more than the price the company was sold for. The result was that the founding entrepreneurs got nothing out of that $450 million exit. What a shame. Crazy. But entrepreneurs often don't realize that's the position they're getting into when they start raising venture capital. Um, so, that, you know, the VCs do it every day. They're good at it. They know the terms they need to protect themselves. The entrepreneurs, you know, most of them do it once, and, and they're not very good at it. And, 
And uh, so that's the risk. You know, you risk spending years of your life building something of considerable value and ending up that uh, you yourself have very little to show for it. And that's crazy. And people don't think about that. They don't, people aren't told in entrepreneurship typically that it's, it's a lot of lonely nights, lonely days, uh, empty bank accounts, all that type of stuff. And they only talk about the exits and the working for yourself and holidays versus the, the realities of it. And the same thing with, when it comes to venture capital. It's a, or well, sa- sadly, the press likes to tell the, the, the fancy stories and the, and the successes. But, you know, when, when people come to uh, really strong entrepreneurship programs like the one we have at London Business School, you know, they, they read case studies and, and they, they uh, see in depth the stories of entrepreneurs who have really struggled with the incredible challenge that comes with being an entrepreneur. And uh, so some entrepreneurs do get briefed on this stuff, but the, the bad reality is that most don't. So when, when you guys are sending LBS students out into, out into the world, what are some of the, the traits that you're hoping that they come away with? Um, besides the knowledge, what are the, what are some of the traits that you're hoping that they're coming out into industry and life with? Well, you know, I, we hope we've given them some tools to deal with the predicted predicted challenges that they're going to face as they start and grow a business. You know, how do you assess the opportunity to make sure it's really worth your while pursuing that? Uh, what is it? What does it take to build? right entrepreneurial team. You know, you, you need not a bunch of clones of each other, but you need people who differ so that you build diversity of perspectives into the team. What do you do about raising resources and, and can you borrow or steal them rather than paying for them? Because it's mm-hmm. hard to get capital. Um, you know, there's a ton of stuff you can learn because other people have been down this road before. And uh, like most things in life, there are good ways to do things and there are better ways to do things and sometimes they're not so good ways to do things we think our grads have a have a leg up because because they they see some of the mistakes others have made uh, and they learn some of the tools and ways of thinking about these challenges so they can address them in a more more disciplined and thoughtful way cool and i and i ask this for, from personal points of view um what's what are some of the projects you're currently working on well, I'm, uh, I just finished delivering a, uh, a one-week program called the International Teachers Program that helps good business school teachers become great business school teachers. And that's been enormous fun to, uh, to share with other, other like-minded faculty. How, how, do we, uh, how do we really give students tools they can use and send them off in the world well-prepared to, to fight the battles we know they're going to face? That's, that's been a, a labor of love. Love and, and that's going to continue through the first half of this year. I've got an idea for a new book on entrepreneurial mindsets and how they differ from those of uh, more conventional business people. And that research is underway, and we'll see whether that bears fruit. So I have enough on my plate to keep me out of trouble, BD. <laughs> Very good. And uh, what, what, are you, what are you reading right now to kind of keep you inspired or reading or listening to on blogs or or? Anything on online podcast? Well, well, I just I just finished reading a book by Rana Farouar, who is the uh, global business correspondent or a global business correspondent for the Financial Times. It's published in the U.S. She's uh, she's a very thoughtful observer of the tech scene, and and the book's title is "Don't Be Evil: The Case Against Big Tech," and she lays out a perhaps a somewhat compelling argument about why things have gone awry and how they've gone awry in, in uh, the big tech world today, uh, particularly with their use of data about people and the uh, surveillance economy, some would call it. Um, and she makes a, makes a case for why some things have to change, why we need some regulation, and so on. It was a, a very thought-provoking read. Very cool. And how can how can our listeners um, follow you, get in touch with you, besides tracking down the, the books, which will be on the website? Um, where else can well, they from you? I, I, I'm on Twitter. Uh, I'm on uh, LinkedIn. I'm uh, there, There's a bunch of stuff on YouTube that I've done. I, I'm pretty easy to find online. Cool. We'll put that all in the show notes so people can track it down. Um, so lastly... 
one one quick fire valuable tip for entrepreneurs when it comes to grow for their grow sell and retire um one thing that if they just listen to this part that if they plug this into their their mindset or their business today it would help them well i, th- I think growth is uh growth is a great thing because it it attracts great people it gives those people motivation to work really hard and and to come together to pursue a common vision. So growing a business, I think, is one of the most noble things we can do in this world. We create jobs. We, we create economic value. So growing a business is something I, I, I hope many of your listeners will aspire to. It's noble work. It's important work. And we, we certainly need more of it in the world today. John Mullins, thank you so much for coming on Grow, Sell, and Retire podcast. I really appreciate it, and I know the listeners got a lot of stuff out of this, so it's very, very helpful. Thanks so much, BD. Always good to talk with you. Thanks, John. Thanks for joining us on Grow, Sell, and Retire. For more information, tools, or to book one of our team members to work with your team, business, or to speak at your event or conference, visit BartDaltonConsulting.com or email contact at BartDaltonConsulting.com. Buy the book True Gravity on Amazon. If you want to work for the rest of your life, that is your business. If you don't, that is ours.